Well, good morning and grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're honored that you're joining with us this morning, whether you're viewing this during our 10 a.m. live stream on Facebook or if you're viewing this anytime on Sunday morning or any other day for that matter on our YouTube channel. Regardless of how you're joining us, we're just glad that you're joining with us this morning as we worship together our risen Lord and Savior. Well, as we gather virtually again this morning, I wanted to offer a brief update on our upcoming worship services. Bishop Leland and the rest of the cabinet issued an update themselves this past week, recommending again that if our church is in a red county, that we should hold off on in-person gatherings. That all being said, the county alert system is updated every two weeks, and this past Thursday, when the new figures were released, as I had hoped and predicted, Rowan County is no longer red. So our plans for reopening for in-person worship are in full swing and set for Palm Sunday, March the 28th. We've been working diligently to figure out the precise details of what that can and will look like practically and safely. And we'll be putting out a separate announcement video with more details of our reopening for in-person worship next week. In the meantime, we are still in need of volunteers to help out with our technology team, particularly on Sunday mornings when we resume our in-person services. The more volunteers we can get for our tech team, the fewer times we'll need to call on you. And a willingness to help matters so much more than any sort of technical expertise. We won't be asking you to do anything that requires more than the most basic understanding and a little bit of training. Uh, so if you're willing to help, please let us know. Send me a text to my cell phone, 704-984-1434 with your name and the phrase tech team, and I'll be in touch. And I'll also be checking the comments down below in this video for our Facebook Live feed. So if you'd like to participate and help out with our tech team, just put tech team in the comment section and we'll be in touch that way as well. I invite you to join with me now in a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, as we are inspired by your word, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection that we are promised in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. And now I'd like to share a montage of our music ministries through the years as presented by Sue Krochko.
Well, our scripture passages for the remainder of the Sundays in Lent before Palm Sunday are all going to be taken from John's Gospel. And in John's Gospel, we find that in the person of Jesus, God gets personal, relational, and becomes personally embodied and present among us. If we would meet and be met by God, we must do so in the, quote, temple that God has given us in the person of Jesus Christ. This talk of Jesus' body is surely the key to our interpretation of our passage this morning. John intrudes with interpretation of Jesus' strange words and deeds by letting us in on a messianic secret that Jesus' body is the new temple, the new place of worship, the new connection between God and humanity. Destroy that temple on a cross and God will restore it in three days at the resurrection because in the body of Jesus, his crucified and then resurrected body, we bodily encounter God and God encounters us. It's a point that's been driven close to home in recent times as we've been forced to realize that being together in a building is not the only way in which we can encounter the living God. Being in fellowship with one another has more to do with who we are in fellowship with across all time even than when, how, or where that fellowship takes place. One of our newly confirmed members from this past fall, Sarah Colbert, will be reading this lesson for us this morning. Tell us about it, would you, Sarah? When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of money, money changers, and overturned their tables. To those he sold doves and said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can we show you to prove our authority to do all of this? Jesus answered to them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Rise again in three days. <laughs> they replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're gonna rise it in three days? But the temple had already spoken of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words of, that Jesus had spoken. Well, let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Animals and church don't usually seem to mix together too well. Historically speaking, we see vestiges of this all over our worship space. This railing up at the front of the chancel area was historically placed in the church not to help people kneel when they prayed or receive communion, but to keep the sheep, the dogs, and the goats from eating the Eucharistic bread on the altar way back in the day. In some churches to this day, it's still described as a fence rather than the more colloquial rail. But in like fashion, this altar table up here, uh, where we have, you know, crosses and the, typically that we'll also have the uh, communion elements, was a structure not so much built for that, but was for a uh, place to offer up animals without blemish, a, a goat, a sheep, a bull, something like that. This place would have smelled of hickory smoke like Gary's or Porky's on most Sabbath days. Apparently God's a fan of barbecue too. But animals and religious establishments don't seem to have the best relationship on the whole, unless you happen to be somewhere like India. That's why I was so amazed in my first pastorate in England. My first service, fresh off the seminary assembly line at Duke, so to speak, was in the little English village of Dedham Heath. Now, this little chapel there was an anomaly of sorts. Back uh, way early on in its history, it was what was known as a primitive Methodist church. Uh, and they referred to all their churches simply as chapels even. Um, and whenever the primitive Methodist church decided to join up with the Wesleyan Methodist and the Bible Christians to form the Methodist Church of Great Britain, 
Um, they just simply painted the uh, part of the sign that said uh, Dedham Heath Primitive Methodist Chapel. They painted the letters primitive black so it would uh, you know, fade in with the rest of the background. But uh, I, my first service was there at that little chapel and I thought I had gotten the time wrong or something as I did have five services scheduled throughout the circuit uh, through 6 p.m. that day. And I got in there and there were only three little old ladies and a golden retriever named Edmund. And uh, I asked if I was on time and they said, oh yes, you know. Uh, she said, it's usually just the three of us. However, sometimes on a, a good Sunday, we may get up to seven people. And like most of the services that I took, as they say in England, uh, I was set to celebrate communion since I was one of the few ordained preachers in the area. And I'd been given a three by five card from the president of the connection that was my, quote, dispensation to provide at baptisms and at the Lord's Supper through the end of the conference year. Leave it to Methodists all around the world to make religious observances a celebration for paperwork. And as the congregants came forward to receive the elements, so too did Edmund the Golden Retriever, right next to his honor. His head even bowed a little bit as he came forward to take just the, uh, the little cube of white bread. Well, one Sunday, the lady who owned Edmund was sick, but like the faithful servant of God Edmund was, Edmund made his way four houses down to the church anyway, and he sat right there on the aisle, right by where his owner used to sit. Uh, I used to joke that I wish I had a church of folks as, as faithful as Edmund the dog, and I'm only halfway joking. Poor Edmund would have uh, had a, a rough time in COVID-19 days. However, most animals had a rough time in the temple in Jerusalem back in Jesus's time. If there was an animal anywhere near the temple, chances are it didn't have a very good shot at remaining alive for very long. Our gospel lesson this morning, that of Jesus cleansing the temple, is uh, something that I think we need to explain a little bit from the outset, though. The Greek word temple used here is a word that is, is very all-inclusive, somewhat like our word church. You know, I went to the church today. And uh, the sanctuary is more what we would think of as the inner part of the temple. Um, but it only took up a very small footprint there of the temple mount, uh, the western wall or the wailing wall that you've probably heard of before, uh, is all that's left of that foundational uh, table almost whereon the temple was built. Um, but those grounds outside the temple, the temple precincts, is uh, the word that's used here. And we're told that Jesus came in and saw all these animals and money changers in this area. And this area was known as the court of the Gentiles. And it's the area where the Gentiles could be welcomed and introduced to the faith of the people of God. It'd be most closely akin to like our narthex of the sanctuary or the sidewalk and, and front lawn area just right out front of the sanctuary. But ironically, the presence of animals and money changers were required for the proper functioning of the temple system at the time. The faithful weren't allowed to tithe with the coinage of Rome, so they had to exchange their secular money for so-called holy money. And even if they had an animal without blemish, it was unlikely that someone from far away from Jerusalem would be able to keep that animal in perfect condition after a long journey. So the faithful would simply buy an animal at the temple when they arrived from afar. Well, Jesus walks in, though, and cannot believe his eyes. He might have even been wondering if he was in the right place. The one area of the temple that was supposed to be the place where those outside the faith might be encouraged to become insiders to the faith had been turned into a convenience store for the insiders. Entering the temple, Jesus discovered how deceiving appearances can be. While the place appeared to fulfill its function, closer inspection revealed that it had forgotten its purpose. The trappings were still in place, but the place had no heart for its raison d'etre. It had been taken over by buyers and sellers, consumers and marketers who knew how to fill the pews and to meet the capital campaign goals. Hewlett Gluer raises a great point with this analysis. He says, 
the ways of the world invade the church gradually, subtly, never intentionally, and always in the service of the church and its mission. But soon the church is full of cattle and sheep and turtle doves and money changers. Well, it's so easy for us to forget that the church is not just for the insiders, but that it's also supposed to be a place, the one place for the outsiders, where they can be welcomed into the fold as well. After all, it, it wasn't Rome who made the court of the Gentiles into a marketplace with money changers and cattle. It was the religious people in charge who did it. The one spot intended as a welcome to the other nations had been turned into a profit scheme by a select greedy few. It's no wonder Jesus makes a whip of cords and goes around like a cowboy driving the animals out. There's no more important practice for a church than to be a welcoming and an inviting people. When we lose sight of welcoming others into God's house, we lose sight of God. And that's especially the case for us in our own time when the internet and digital interaction has become a new means whereby we are all to welcome outsiders into the fold. There's a great hymn written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette about this very story that illustrates my point so much more eloquently. She writes, When prayer gave way to profit and pride closed many doors, the Lord cried out in anger and made a whip of cords. He shooed the sheep and cattle and scattered pigeons too. God's house was for all people, not just a chosen few. O oh God, you love the nations and call us all to pray. Forgive us when our worship turns other folks away. As Christ, in loving protest, fault prejudice and pride, may we who follow Jesus now welcome all inside. But what else does this story say to you and me and to our church? Does it say that animals are never supposed to be in the church property? Well, I don't think so, but some have said so. Does it say that nothing should be bought or sold on church property? Some have even said yes to that one, but I don't think that's what this story is telling us either. I think this story goes much, much deeper in explaining things to us. Jesus disturbed business as usual. Jesus disturbed the attitudes of the people who weren't welcoming others. Jesus disturbed the attitudes of the people who were looking only after themselves, trying to make a quick buck. Jesus disturbed a purity system that disallowed a specific group of people because of where they were born. Jesus still disturbs. Jesus still overturns tables. Jesus still cleanses. Jesus still welcomes the outsiders. Appearances can be deceiving. I first thought I saw a pitiful group of elderly folks at Dedham Heath Methodist Chapel. It's really hard to preach to just three people and not be discouraged and maybe even a little depressed. But I grew to look forward to being there in that little rundown chapel with them. Uh, it's now been closed several years ago, but up until the very end, Edmund was there every Sunday. After the service was over, I, I got into my car and I pulled out my journal and I recorded the name of the place where it was, the time, and the number of folks that were there. And I initially wrote a three, but I... Uh, crossed it out, and put a four. I wish I had a church full of folks everywhere that I've been who are as faithful as Edmund the Golden Retriever. May we all follow that same sense of faithfulness, that same sense of welcome, that same sense of hospitality here at First Church in China Grove and beyond. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you for the kindness you've shown? Lord, help me, Jesus, I've wasted. So uh -huh. 
Try me, Lord. If you think there's a way I can try to repay all I've taken from you. Maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself. I had to put in a picture or a video rather of some cute little golden retriever puppies. I mean, this is what the internet was made for, right people? Good morning. I just wanted to remind everyone watching our service today that the updated church directories are available for pickup. These are free to anyone who would like one. The church office is open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. if you'd like to come by and get one. If you are not able to stop by the office, I will be happy to mail one out to you. Uh, just call the church office at 704-857-9713 to let me know. Thanks and have a blessed day. Well, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I have several prayer concerns I'd like to lift up. If we could always be in prayer for the students, educators, and all of those, especially uh, those on staff at China Grove Middle School and at Southeast Middle School. Please also remember the following folks in your prayers. Terry Holt, Tom and Lily Easterling, Rick and Wanda Allman, Benny and Patsy, Lex Graham, Pat Smathers, and Sally Askew. Please also remember Eddie Kroll, who's recuperating after back surgery, Shirley Carricker, and Johnny Graham. Please also remember those in our church family who continue to be in the care of hospice, Terry Vinson and Sarah King's grandmother, Jean Irvin. I'd also like to pass along a few other prayer requests we've received recently. Mark Starnes, Gail Friesen, and Richard Jensen. And the family of Russ Fallbush and Julie Whitaker's grandmother also passed away uh, a week or so ago. So I ask that you keep the family of Doris Lingerfelt in your prayers as well. We also heard that uh, Vicki Lippard had been hospitalized recently. So our prayers are also with Vicki. And if you would also um, lift up Mike Honeycutt, who is my wife Jennifer's uncle, um, who's in the hospital with a terrible infection right now and uh, is kind of uh, just day to day. So please uh, remember Mike in your prayers as well. I'd like to leave you this day for our benediction with a traditional Irish blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall softly upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.